من شیما هستم من اله هستم شیما ماینمیز اله and today as I'm talking to you it has been 718 days I have no news of my father because Ibrahim Babai my father when intended to get out of Iran was uh, disappeared uh, and by the Iranian authorities and since then I have no news of him and the fear of what has happened to him has affected my families and myself, my, my life. Not only uh, anonymous people who uh, claim that they were agents and they told me that my father has died, they approached me and in order to uh, uh, kidnap me, they took me to the borders of Iran. Uh, they tried to do so. And my, the authorities, they claim that uh, my father has never existed. And uh, during the first few days of my father's detention, a, a mate in the detention uh, told me that my father, as the authorities told, uh, told that he has died, he was alive. This is not the whole life of my story. I'm here today in order to tell you that how the injustice and inequality has affected a, 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 a Iranian young woman uh, made her a combatant. And I have to tell you that people like me, uh, the number of us is uh, quite too uh, m many. And uh, uh, you are standing uh, with people who have resisted against the regime, and the obligatory hijab is one of the symbols of the injustice. And you, the international community, uh, remembering that we have right to exist, and you have to indicate that we exist and uh, you are cooperating with the uh, Iranian regime. I am a woman, a mother, a protester, a freedom lover, a victim. This is the sound, the voice of a hundred other eyes who have been targeted by bullets in order to stop them from protesting. I'm very lucky that I'm alive because hundreds of other people, they died and they are not with us today. I'm very lucky today in order to be here because I could have uh, been detained and in prison like hundreds of others. Let me say that I am not Elahe Tavakulyan. I am Mahsa, Nika, Sarina, Kian, Minu. Majid Reza, Asra, Mehshad, Fereshte, Sadaf, and Mohammed, Hamid Reza. These names we have heard about them. And they were names that never uh, had the chance to be heard. Hundreds, thousands of families are mourning for their beloved ones. I want to be their voice today. Since I remember, I have involved with the injustice and the violence of the state. The 14 years of age, I was the first victimized by the, uh, these laws. And after one year later, or, uh, one year later in the, during the protest against the regime and the election, uh, I was victimized again. And all my life during uh, my teenage uh, life, my father was imprisoned and while later when we received about 74 lashes he was released but the life of my story started since i, st I uh, began to uh, deny to be a slave i then removed the scarf on my head and i used every little opportunity to show my hair 
and my uh, pictures were shared in the social media. Then the authorities came to me. I was uh, taken to the moral police. I was 22 years of age. And in the same building where Mahsa Amini, the 22 years old Iranian woman, was murdered there, I was interrogated prior to getting to the uh, building. As I have put the scarf on my shoulder, I made a video of myself and I shared it in the social media. And I announced that I am not scared of detention and uh, threats and I will say no to the regime. And uh, my father also was not silent and he was beaten in front of me. Both of us were detained and then he was condemned to receive 74 uh, lashes and I was a sentence to detention, and the judge told me it is a law. You, I want just to. Uh and in Dr. H. I was going uh, for the interest exam. However, I was deprived from uh, continuation of my education. I was then sacked from my job, and I was deprived from receiving my document certificates from the uh, university and so deprived from social life. We have gathered here for the uh, honoring the human rights, honoring the uh, freedom principles. Um, coming from a country who has a long background of civilization, Iran. Maybe you have heard about Kurosh, uh, 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 and he has uh, established 2,500 2, years ago a new set of legislation. And now look where we are. The authorities, the regime in Iran, uh, which he has an omissity with our uh, uh, background, and they are violating the human rights. They kill people, Republic of Islamic Republic of people. Uh, Islamic regime, like uh, Faroon, knows himself as the representative of the God on the earth and use all our wealth in order to make uh, more uh, prisons and make more advanced uh, arms. Uh, hundreds of people, they lost their eye. And I would like to ask ask you to have a look to the reports from the, for the uh, explaining the violence of Iranian authorities and look how many people they lost their beloved one. And uh, uh, a Kian Pir Falak body was put in the ice. And who is now beyond the uh, bars, like Tumaj uh, Salehi, Nargis Mohammadi, and hundreds of other people? The Islamic regime says that the protesters are forming just a, a little percentage of the society. I give you an example. Imagine that in your country, 10 of celebrities, sportsmen, singers, workers, uh, they are detained. And then you are said that all of them are guilty. Do you believe such a claim? Today, all of Iranians uh, uh, are under pressure. And if they protest even a little, they are getting uh, destroyed. For two years, I was de uh, arrested five times. And in the very last case, uh, for protesting against the hijab, I was sentenced to six years and banning from leaving the country. And I was deprived from uh, continuation of my education in university. They, were, they put uh, pressure on me in order to give up and become a, a slave. However, I had no other way rather than struggling and fighting. And I was 23 years when I was involuntarily exiled. And for the last time, as the uh, officers, they shot at me on the border, I look at my country on the top of a mountain. At that moment, I promised to myself that I uh, struggle, I fight for all other people who were exiled until our uh, country becomes safe. And being a woman is not a, a crime. And uh, no one could be put behind the, behind the bars because of their ideas, and they don't get death sentence. And today, as my father is a victim, victim of uh, the disappearance, 
I have no doubt that I have to fight for a life, a normal life, what has been uh, stolen from my, my people. I have to fight. I was a protester. And I came to the fore, but they shot me in my eyes within minutes. Please, I urge you to listen to my voice, to the voice of us protesters. It's very important for me and for all Iranian people, their fight for freedom. We need your support. We need your support to carry on our slogan of women, uh, free life, freedom. The Islamic Republic continues to um, cut, cut us off from the world by uh, blocking internet. You, please remember the uh, shutting down of the Ukrainian plane by the uh, Iranian regime, how they uh, raided the Iranian uh, students' hostel and dozens of students were killed. Please know that we Iranian people have gone through all the legal channels available to us to realize our rights, but in vain, sadly because the nature of this regime is to be against women, against freedom, against democracy. By awarding this very courageous woman, Nargis Mohammadi, with the Nobel Peace Prize, you have given the Iranian people in guarantee some kind of security for our political prisoners. So, and it's important for you to pay attention to Iran so that the Iranian regime authorities know that they are not going to isolate our people, that you are watching, you're watching their every move to make sure that they're not continuing their suppression of people. Look, woman life freedom is not just a slogan, it's our roadmap. And we, what is our um, weapon? Our weapon of the uh, Iranian women is their hair. By removing their hijab, they are standing up to the Iranian military, to the Iranian authority. We want to be a very Iranian people to live in democracy, in freedom. Uh, and I urge you to please, by respecting your own values, at least understand that we need you, that the world is a global village. We need each other and we need your support to realize our rights and our freedoms. Thank you very much. Don't be afraid. At least you countries, well, the champion human rights and freedom, please. Uh, uh, don't be afraid. Go to Iran. A few days ago, Sima Morid Begi, who had lost her arm, uh, in the protest, met with German leaders, but they kept their meeting behind closed doors. Why? Because they don't want to jeopardize their relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Look, there are, um, Look at the region, how the Iranian um, regime is sending forces to Palestine, to elsewhere in the region, how they're selling drones to the Russians with which they are killing innocent Ukrainians. Don't be afraid in the West. Please stand up for us. And there are groups that defend the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran uh, regime, unfortunately. But please stand by us, not by those groups who defend the Islamic Republic of Iran. We need you. We need uh, you. I used, I, was, I used to be a normal citizen who could not bear it anymore, could not bear the situation in Iran. Now that I'm in the West, I feel I have this responsibility to try and stand up for my people, not to remain silent. I know that every time I talk, the Islamic Republic of Iran 
Taliban is watching every word I say, and they are there are more and more uh, legal cases against me in Iran. But I am standing up for the voices of the Iranian people. Uh, I long live freedom, long live the freedom-seeking men and women of Iran. A powerful uh, message from uh, two Iranian uh, women's rights activists. Shima Babayi, uh, currently in exile in Belgium, and Elia Tavakolian, uh, in exile in Italy. San Sendegi Yasadi, the, the resonating chant of uh, women, uh, life, freedom, uh, echoed uh, strongly yesterday in the city hall of Oslo as uh, Kiana and Ali delivered a strong speech uh, penned by their mother, Nargis uh, Muhammadi, who is uh, behind the walls in the Evin prison. And she also sends us a strong message of hope when she says the Iranian people will dismantle obstruction and despotism through their persistence. Have no doubt, this is certain. That's the words from Nargis. And she adds, I'm confident that the light of freedom and justice will shine, bright, shine brightly on the land of Iran. At that moment, we will celebrate the victory of democracy and human rights. Today, we find ourselves in the Ola Room at the University of Oslo, uh, adorned with the masterpieces of uh, Edvard Munch, notably his uh, depiction of the sun, Munch uh, aimed to con uh, convey both a sense of the specifically Norwegian and the universally human with the idea of uh, enlightenment. And this uh, serves as a starting point for our discussion today, burning for democracy. The blazing uh, sun behind me, uh, uh, casting its rays in all directions, symbolizes hope. And in front of the sun today, the stage is uh, adorned with uh, street art from Iranian artists. Il Stensil and Mad Stensil, highlighting that protests in Iran also involve using art to challenge the system. Welcome to the Nobel Peace Prize Forum 2023 here in the University Ola in Oslo. Also a warm welcome to those of you following us via social media platforms and various TV stations worldwide. I'm Eric Osheim, and it's my pleasure to moderate this year's Nobel Peace Prize uh, Forum. First of all, I'm delighted to introduce the director at the Norwegian Nobel Institute, Olav Njørstad. Thank you, Eric. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this Nobel Peace Prize Forum 2023. Hosted in cooperation with the University of Oslo and with financial support from the City of Oslo and the Forum for International Forum, uh, Forum for International Understanding, London. We thank our partners for their invaluable support. As you know, the topic of this year's forum is the struggle for democracy and freedom in Iran, with a particular focus on the plights and the rights of women. Since the Islamic Revolution in 1979, <clears throat> the theocratic regime has posed a constant threat to the well-being of the people of Iran as well as to the to regional peace and security. <clears throat> Sorry. The aim of this year's forum is to explore the situation which 
Iranian women are facing in their daily lives and to put their struggle into a broader regional and human rights context. It is our tradition always to invite a former Nobel Peace Prize laureate to the forum. This year, we are honored by the presence of two former laureates. One is the Iranian lawyer and human rights activist, Dr. Shirin Ebadi. who received the Nobel Peace Prize 20 years ago in 2003. You will be meeting her shortly. First, however, I am proud to introduce the other former Nobel Peace Prize laureate present here today, Amnesty International, which was awarded the prize in 1977. Since 2021, Amnesty International has been headed by Secretary General Agnès Calamar, the highly esteemed French political scientist and human rights expert. Before taking on her current position, Ms. Calamar was the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions. In that capacity, she led the UN inquiry into the assassination of Saudi journalist Yamal Khashoggi. In her keynote this morning, she will, among other things, share with us some of the findings from a recently published Amnesty International report on how Iranian police and security forces systematically have committed rape, gang rape, and other sexual violence against peaceful protesters, including children. Please welcome Ms. Kalamar. Good morning. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Um, after yesterday's ceremony honoring and celebrating formidable human rights defender Nargis Mohammadi, and as the world marks the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But it pains me greatly that Nargis is not here herself to receive the prize she deserves to be here with her husband, her children, her brother, her friends, her community. I am outraged that instead she remains behind bars facing ill treatment and possibly torture. At Amnesty International, we will not rest until the Iranian authorities release her unconditionally and all other activists and human rights defenders who are unlawfully detained. Despite so many years of unimaginable cruelties inflicted to silence her, Nargis Mohammadi's courageous demands for justice transcend prison walls and are here with us today. We must stand with her and all other human rights defenders, activists in Iran, not just through words of solidarity, but also through action. And we've heard already about the call for action. The international community has a vital role in ensuring justice for the far too many victims of human rights violations in Iran. But I am here today to report to you on some of the most darkest forms of repression imposed on the people of Iran right now. You all know that on uh, 16 of September 2022, the death in custody of uh, Massa Hamini sparked an unprecedented popular uprising. She had been ar arrested a few days earlier by the so-called morality police for not complying with the country's abusive compulsory veiling laws for women and girls. Hundreds of thousands of women, men, school children, university students poured into the street across the country in mass nationwide protest 
really inspiring many of us around the world, inspiring me personally. They displayed a bold determination to defy an unpopular establishment, theocratic establishment, steeped in impunity, discrimination and oppression. And they fought for Iran's transition to a system respecting equality, human rights and democracy. Women and girls were at the forefront of this popular uprising, challenging decades of gender-based discrimination and violence. They defied the compulsory veiling law, which had subjected them for decades to daily harassment, violence, and led to their arbitrary detention, torture, and ill-treatment. Denial to access to education, employment, public space, treated as second-class citizen. The slogan, Woman, life, freedom quickly became the symbol and message of the uprising. It was chanted by countless protesters, including schoolgirls, elementary uh, children. It was written on the walls across the country and beyond the country. I participated to marches, um, for instance, on, on Women's Day and uh, uh, on, on, on Human Rights Day in Mexico, and we all chanted. All of us chanted in Mexico, woman, life, freedom. The images of women courageously burning their headquarters, their headscarves, you can burn headquarters too if you want, but. <laughs> and appearing in protest unveiled resonated nationally and globally. Protested, expressed demand for the dissolution of the Islamic Republic system and its replacement with a secular democratic system respecting human rights. How did the authorities respond? Well, as we know, they responded by unleashing what we described at, at Amnesty as a brutal, militarized, militarized crackdown to crush the spirit of resistance, to deter protesters from further gathering, to humiliate them, to punish them, for standing up against the Islamic Republic system. The crackdown involved the extensive use of unlawful force, killings resulting in hundreds of deaths, thousands of injuries, mass arrest. Ten of thousands of people by the Iranian authorities' own admission. Those arrested were routinely subjected to torture and we owe it to Nargis Mohammadi, who was among the first to bravely raise the alarm about the use of sexual violence against the detainees after the uprising began. We have carried comprehensive investigation into the commission of rape and sexual violence during the uprising and issued a report last week. We found that the Iranian authorities committed rape, gang rape, and other sexual violence against protesters, including children as young as 12. These were not incident by rogue element, as the authority may try to argue, or not. All security forces participated everywhere in the country. Agents from the Revolutionary Guard, the paramilitary Basish Force, the Ministry of Intelligence, different branches of the police force. Rape and sexual violence were used against women, men, girls, boys, constituted a key weapon in the Iranian Authority armory of repression of the protest and suppression of dissent. I'm here speaking on behalf of my colleagues at Amnesty International, and I want to pay credit for them, because from January last year, they relentlessly uh, conducted this investigation and heard the most agonizing testimony, after testimony, about the rape. I hesitated for a long time. I thought, you know, who am I to speak uh, about what happened? Um, in front of a large audience made up of Iranian people. So I thought maybe what I could do is, um, you know, give you some of the testimonies. I tried to find the one that were not as gruesome as what you may read 
in, in the report, because what was committed on the bodies of the protesters, some of them really young kids, full of energy and, 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 and spirit for life, coming into the street, and then they were, they were caught. So let me read from Mariam. I've censored her a bit for the purpose of this audience. My friends and I removed our veils in public and we were chanting. With the thought never crossed my mind that the security forces would arrest us. But they did. They caught us. They called us vulgar words. They mocked. They ridiculed us. They slapped us. They punched and kicked us in our genitals and our breasts. I tried to hold into my friend's hands because I was so terrified. But they kicked me so violently I had to let her go. And then they threw me into a solitary confinement cell. And they interrogated me until the middle of the night. They started ripping my clothes. I was screaming, begging them to stop apologizing for what I had done. But they kept going. In response to my pleading, they punched me hard in my mouth and my mouth got filled with blood. There were three of them, including the interrogator. I remember two of them raping me. I was so small compared to them. They raped me in every possible way. After that, I lost consciousness. And they, I regained it when they threw water on my head and shouting, shouted to others, come and take the filthy slut. They kept me in solitary confinement for weeks. They gave me no medical care for my injuries, not even a tissue. No doctor ever came to see me. I suffered from bleeding and infection, and I had to use part of my torn clothes for the bleeding. We heard dozens of testimonies like that one. From men, from women, from children as young as 12. They were held alongside adults in cruel and inhuman conditions. Women and girls were held in detention centers run by all male security forces, exposing them to heightened risk of rape and other forms of sexual violence. And months after their horrific ordeals, all of them have continued to deal with deep psychological and physical trauma. The mother of a school boy who was raped, he was 12, told Amnesty International that her son attempted suicide twice. Sahar, one of the survivors, told us, I used to be a fighter in life. Even when the Islamic Republic tried to break me down, I carried on. However, recently, I think about suicide a lot. I am a person who waits all day long for nighttime so I can sleep. So that's the purpose of rape and sexual violence, to break. To break down the women, the girls, to break down their families, to break down their communities, to humiliate, to deter, to repress, to impose the most gruesome pain. And then followed systemic impunity. Not a single state official has been criminally investigated, let alone tried and punished for sexual violence, even when a few courageous survivors dared to complain. Instead, Consistent with their appalling, long-standing record, prosecutorial authorities have actively contributed to the state machinery of torture. They dismissed and covered up the complaint of survivors coerced into giving false confession because of torture, because of rape. Prosecutors and judges have used those confessions to bring more charges against survivors and some of them have even been sentenced to death. One of them, at least, was executed and we're very worried about many others. 
Victims have been left with no recourse, no redress, only institutionalized impunity, silencing, and multiple physical and psychological scars running deep and far. Today, Iran rem remains in the throes of a protracted and deep-rooted human rights and impunity crisis. In a desperate attempt to prevent any more challenge to their iron grip on power, in the years since the uprising, the authorities have intensified their crackdown on human rights defenders, activists, students, journalists, and all those seeking truth and justice. They have doubled down on their all-out assault on women and girls who chose not to wear the compulsory headscarf in public. Morality policing is back, placing over 40 million women and girls under surveillance. Countless women have been suspended or expelled from universities, barred from sitting final exams, denied access to banking services, public transport. Others have been prosecuted, sentenced to imprisonment, degrading punishment. And today's massive crackdown is intensified by mass surveillance technology. In a two month period, from April to June 2023, Iran's police sent almost one million SMS messages to women driving without a veil. They were captured through artificial intelligence and received those very threatening messages. Some of them had their cars removed from them altogether. That's Big Brother on a scale unheard of. This is taking place amid a spate of hateful official statements referring to unveiling as a virus, a social illness, disorder. Prosecution authorities have repeatedly and shamefully tried to condition Nargis Mohammadi's access to adequate health care on her complying with Iran's abusive and degrading compulsory veiling laws. As a result, her access to treatment for serious lung and heart conditions has been delayed or denied. There is absolutely no prospect for justice domestically. This is what we heard. This is what Amnesty International findings have shown over and over again. This is why we need the international community. This is why we need state in Europe, in particular because we have universal jurisdiction uh, legal provision. We urge them to initiate criminal investigation against suspected perpetrators under the principle of universal jurisdiction with a view to issuing international arrest warrant. We demand that state support the extension of the mandate of the UN fact-finding mission on Iran to ensure that the independent mechanism continues to collect, preserve, analyze evidence of crimes under international law so that sometimes in the near future, justice can be delivered. Now, I would like to play for you a video clip. Last year, during the Women Life Freedom Uprising in Iran, hundreds of thousands of women, men and children bravely protested against decades of inequality and oppression. In a new investigation, Amnesty International reveals that security forces tortured protesters through rape and other sexual violence in detention. My friends and I removed our veils in public and we were chanting. More than 30 members of the Revolutionary Guards threw us into a van. They called us vulgar words and punched and kicked us in our genitals and breasts. I tried to hold on to my friends' hands because I was so terrified but they forcefully threw me into a solitary confinement cell. They violently raped me. Even wild animals don't do these things. I feel destroyed. A year on from the uprising, survivors continue to live with the physical and psychological trauma. 
Survivors said they're sharing their horrific ordeals with the world so that justice can be pursued. It's our collective duty to stand with them and their families. Let's raise our voices to hold the Islamic Republic authorities to account for using sexual violence as a weapon of torture to repress protests and instill fear. Call on your government to pursue universal jurisdiction over Iranian officials responsible for torture and other crimes under international law. Silence is not an option. Silence is not an option. And each and every act of solidarity, every voice raised in protest, every demand for justice, support and amplify the action of the people in Iran. Silence is not an option because of the risk of further bloodshed. With the authorities' refusal to address the long-standing grievance of people in Iran, public outrage may once again explode into further rounds of mass protest and into further rounds of violence, sexual violence, rape, torture. Impunity has facilitated increasingly brutal responses by the authority to each protest wave since December 2017. So silence is not an option. Muted, timid international response to the Iranian government's crimes will only embolden them further. On the occasion of Nobel Peace Prize 2023 to Nargis Mohammadi, on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the UDHR, I wish to call on us all to stand and act for all the women, men, youth, children of Iran and to say that silence is not an option. 1948 gifted us the UDHR, showing how, in the face of even the worst that human beings can do to each other, a vision for justice and humanity is possible. Nargis Mohammadi is telling us that we have a responsibility to keep fighting for it in spite of everything we're watching, witnessing, being made sometimes complicit to around the world. In spite of the violence in Iran, in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Sudan, we must keep fighting. We must keep fighting against the darkness forced upon us by tyranny, violence, wars, and fear the darkness forced upon us by indifference, double standard, aggression, and repression. So on the occasion of the UDHR 75th anniversary, I urge us all to resist. Resist the globalized, the localized, the national attacks against rights everywhere, beginning with Iran. I call on us all to transform and to reshape the laws, the policies, the system that repress, that repress dissent, repress the people of Iran and beyond Iran. I call on all of us to disrupt, to disrupt the system of oppression and repression in Iran and beyond Iran, to disrupt the system around the world that violates rights and silence defenders the world over, the system of repression that ignores the cries for help and the thousands of people killed because of their ethnicity, race, and religion. In our complete indifference, we must disrupt our indifference, our lack of courage, and our silence. We must disrupt the normalization of repression and oppression. We must disrupt the lack of courage and the too many voices that says nothing can be done. Everything can be done when we come together. We must disrupt the building of a world order that leaves far too many people falling off the abyss. We must be a 1948 generation for the 2048 generation. We must all be worthy of Nargis Mohammadi. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Agnes uh, Kalimar, for, for this uh, extremely strong uh, message. Uh, we have to break the silence. That's, uh, we will uh, discuss that also when we continue with this uh, Nobel Peace Prize Forum. Um, we will change a, a little bit the, the theme. Um, wise, funny, and heartbreaking. Uh, that's how the New York Times described Persapolis. Marianne Satrapi is acclaimed graphic uh, memoir of uh, growing up in uh, Iran uh, during the Islamic Revolution. The animated uh, feature film version of Persepolis was nominated for an Academy uh, Award for Best Animated Feature in 2007. Let's have a look. Mes liens sont toujours et resteraient toujours des liens très très profondes. Nous sommes en train de vivre un moment historique. Et c'est reparti. Au lit, tout de suite. Marge, ce n'est pas un comportement digne d'une future prophète. Mais mon Dieu. Tous ensemble de marcher vers la démocratie. Nous aurons enfin une société faite de justice et de liberté. Le peuple a voté démocratiquement à 99,99% ,99 pour la République islamique. Le voile est synonyme de liberté. Sortez tout en rang. Plus vite. Roger, Daniel, Cartagena. Ça, qu'est-ce que c'est Michael Jackson Ça fait 20 ans que je travaille pour ce pays. Un nouveau gouvernement a été instauré. Nous n'avons plus de prisonniers politiques. Comment osez-vous nous mentir comme ça Jamais qui tu es et d'où tu viens. T'as vu une révolution et une guerre. Ah ouais Waouh Balèze. Marian Satrapi, please join me on the stage. In September 2023, just uh, some months ago, um, uh, let's, it's working, these uh, slides here. Uh, you released a graphic novel, Woman, Life, uh, Freedom, uh, together with uh, uh, 20 uh, artists. This is the cover. We also are happy that we could use your illustration uh, for this year's uh, yes forum. And this book was made to, to support the wave of, uh, of process that has shaken Iran since the death of uh, Masha Gina Amini last year. And you also opened the, the book with her portrait seen through your eyes. Uh, we heard Amnesty International now. Uh, we have to break the silence. Uh, do you think also, you know, you as an artist uh, organizing this kind of books, what kind of role can you play in breaking the silence? Uh, well, hello, and um, thank you for having me here. Um, I mean, I think that artists, they must uh, remain humble with the change that we can actually do to the world. If art would change really anything, uh, for example, everybody in the world should be in love because like 99% of the song is I love you, don't leave me, come into my arms. <laughs> and yeah. it basically everybody hates everybody. So, you know, I mean, it, we, we, we don't have this effect. But at the same time, you know, when I started making Persepolis, that was 1999 when I started doing it. It was published in 2000. And it was like a, nobody wanted to talk about this subject because it was extremely painful. And uh, it has been, you know, we, we should not forget that Iran is a country that has made 
the most number of revolution during the 20th and the 21st century. Mm. I mean, you have no country that has made as many revolutions. It starts with the revolution of 1905, the constitution on monarchy, and then 1915, 1919, 21, you, you, you can go on. So our people, they're actually fighting every day. So for me, it was like I had to say something at the time. The book that was published, it is like going, you know, to demonstrate is very good, but demonstration, you know, is always a momentum, and then it, you just forget about it. For me, it was very important not only to make a book um, to explain to the other ones what is happening in our country, because obviously, I mean, it's not also the, the you know, the press that is lazy, is also, they, 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 they don't have any visa to go and report what is happening in Iran, and I just don't blame them 100%. But, you know, uh, and also, you know, in the Western world, it is uh, a revolution, is that when you have millions of people coming mm. out, I mean, our people, they cannot come in million out because they will all be killed. So the revolution has taken another shape, but to explain to them what happened. So that was the, 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 the goal. And then to translate it uh, and put it in, in, uh, in Persian. Yeah. Uh, and free online. for free, free, for free, free for uh, person, also Iranian women and Absolutely. Iranian general can, can actually Absolutely. read this book. Yeah. Absolutely. And the reason for that, and the reason among the 20 artists, I wanted most of them not to be Iranian. Because if I do care about Iran, is normal. Mm. But when a French cartoonist, a Belgian cartoonist, an Argentinian cartoonist, when they care about it, for the Iranian, for a young Iranian who goes in the street, take off her scarf or what, you know, whatever act of resistance that they do that are, that are just as, you know, peaceful as dancing, singing, uh, and just tr trying to be happy. Yeah. To know that, you know, the inter international artists, they, 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 they support them, I thought it was important. Mm. Because, we, you know, we, we have the paintings here on the, the street art here on the stage, and many young, young people in, in, inside Iran uh, express their rebellion on walls through graffiti, slogans, or even small choreography at the base of their buildings, etc. Uh, Marianne, uh, uh, Again, so what kind of power can drawing, dance, art hold in this context? Well, we should not forget that we are, big, you know, the, in Iran, the pilgrims, uh, they go to the tomb of Hafez. Uh, we celebrate uh, our poets like no other people, they celebrate their poets. Uh, we actually talk into a poetry, and this poetry is as uh, old as 1,000 years. I mean, the Shahnameh of Ferdowsi saved our language from the Arab invasion. So we are a, we are a culture of people, and Iranian people, they're happy people. The, the, the way they cope with the thing, mm. uh, you hear us being uh, moved, being angry, and we have all the rights. But when we are among ourselves, the thing that actually saves us is our sense of humor. And to have a sense of humor, you have to be fucking intelligent, because humor is based, you know, it's not crying. Cry, we all cry for the same reason. It's, it's very normal to cry. But laughter is based on some abstract notion. And we have always coped with our history with this sense of humor that I try to have in Persepolis, that I try to keep. But you should listen to our conversation. The way the Iranian people, they, they actually fight is, uh, this man who is in the bazaar of Rasht, whose name is Sadabouri, he started you know, making this song. So he is this guy who's selfish, actually. Mm. And this is taken over by all the people. It does not diminish at all. I mean, after all the testimony that we heard from Shima and Elahe and by Madame Kalama, of course, you know, that, that, that what I say seems a little bit like too light. But this is exactly this lightness that they don't like. Uh, this is exactly because we love life that they don't like us. Mm. It's because exactly they want us to be sad. Because they exactly they want us, you know, to see it and you know complain like they do. Because they don't want us to live love life. This is why they kill us. And that is how all my life I have told them, fuck you, mm. just by laughing, just by, by standing. And, and never, and never give them my. Mm. They will never see my tears. Mm. They're going to see my laughter. They're going to see my anger at the worst. But my laughter, 
look at me, whatever you did, you will not break us. Yeah. And just to finish, yeah. I, I had to finish that, is, you know, we heard women, and they're extremely scared of us, and they have to be scared of us, because we are bold, and we are strong, and we are brave, and no matter what they do, no matter how many times they will rape us physically, mentally, whatever they do, we will fight back, you know? This But when, I, when, uh, when we heard a heartbreaking message from Amnesty International, uh, I saw your tears uh, also. Uh, but how, you know, and the, you say also the humor, you know, it's so, it's so important also that, you know, that it's not easy to, you know, think humor when you know the reality. Well, the, reali the reality of the fact is that you can complain until the moment that the thing you complain about is bearable. When it becomes unbearable, either you shoot yourself in the head or you laugh about it. There is no third way. If you can cry about something, that is still, you can, you can cope with it. Mm. Uh, so that has been the survivor of our country. But I have to put a point on something that is extremely important is that why this time I became this involved in what is happening in, in Iran? Because, you know, I mean, since this uh, Islamic regime has been on its 44 years of protest, is because democracy is a culture. Mm. Uh, in March 1980, my mother went to the demonstration against the veil. I was with my mom. I was 10 years old. My dad was there. He was one of a few men. But that was no men. Mm. And... Uh, they, on, the, on, the, on the poster, the, the women, they were writing, women's right, they're, they are the society's right. At, at the time, even the leftists, they say, oh, this is the war between, you know, social classes. They didn't support us. Mm. Today, what is happening, l woman life freedom, of course, is a, a movement that is generated by women. But why do I believe in it? Mm. Because men, they are behind us. Mm. Because it's not anymore the middle upper class in the big cities in in a few places in Tehran, in Shiraz, here and there. If you take the map of Iran and you put a pins of where the protests are happening, it covers all the social classes, it covers all the country. There are men and women, and there are boys that have been arrested, that have been raped, they have been killed, executed, because they have been chanting women, life, freedom. So you have to understand, international have to understand, that this is the first feminist revolution in the world and I am really not exaggerating. I mean, I have said it. This is the first feminist movement in the world, and the women's rights are the human rights. Until we have not solved the prob this problem, we cannot aim towards democracy. So, yeah. The first time I, I had the pleasure to interview you in... You in, um, in The first time I had the pleasure to interview you in, in, in Paris, where when Persepolis was uh, translated into Norwegian, and that was in 2008, so it's a long time ago. But I remember you were also that you know you were speaking a lot about hope. Um, now, f so many years later, you know, do, do you still maintain uh, this hope? It's not hope that I have. I have certainty. Yeah. It's not. I, I mean, the Islamic Republic is, is factually dead. You know, people, they have to understand that. When you, you are a government, when 85% people, 85 of the people, they're against you, and be, among this 15%, you have, okay, 5% that are like these religious fanatics, but 10% of them is just business and money and all of that. Mm -hmm. When you have this country that, for the majority, they want to change, when you have this country that are aiming so much for democracy, and for freedom, and a government that comes from the Middle Ages, this government does not represent this country. And people, they have to understand, I mean, in Europe, everybody is like, oh, Islamic Republic, like if it was this big black monster, like, you know, like a big thing, they are not this solid at all. Don't forget, any dictator that falls down, a night before he falls down, everybody is convinced that he is there, stable. And when he falls down, everybody say, how did he keep such a long time? Mm. So it's a certainty because the culture has changed. Mm. And 90% of a democratic revolution is the cultural revolution. That has happened. Now, the 
it remains. And this is for that, that we need the international support because we cannot, of course we can do it. And we are, I mean, me, I don't think no Iranian, they're saying, oh, European, go and make the revolution for us. No. Not at all. Go and make a war for us. Not at all. But it's, it's, it's a gap between that and actually inviting the mayor of Tehran, the butcher of Tehran to Belgium. This is not possible that Germany sells you know, the, 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 these things, you know, to, to check Iranian people artificial to Iranian. This is not possible. The, you, know, you know, you cannot just, and then. You, I'm, talking, I'm talking about, oh, maybe we should take the, 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 the nuclear discussion again with the Iranian. This is fucking not possible. This, you know, I mean. If you don't come and support us, at least don't stab us in the back. It's a people, these, these people, you know, they, they're, they're fighting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and also, I mean, I, I, I really need to say that. Also, we are, we are entering into a world that we are, have a new Cold War with a, you know, a block of Russia and China and the only warrant of democracy in the world right now is Europe because the American democracy, you know, with Trump and all of that is a little bit, you know, like a, it looks a little bit like completely decadent. So the only place that is remain for democracy is actually Europe. Mm. Any country that comes towards democracy is actually good for the European. Mm. If even you calculate in the most cynical way, a democratic Iran is good for the whole world. Why do I say that? Mm. You know, the, the political Islam came with the revolution of 1979. Iran getting rid of the political Islam is a big signal to all these other countries. They're actually, they are behind all the jihadis, they're behind the Hamas, they're behind everything that, it, that is happening. A democratic Iran is a more feeble Russia. A democratic Iran is a more feeble Hamas. A democratic Iran is democracy in the West Asia because I refuse this Middle East that I hate, but th this is it. So, you know, we are, you know, the globe is round, as we know, mm. and we are not living in the 17th century when we are on the back of the horses. It takes us a half a year to go on the other side. Mm. Any terrorist, take a, take, a, take a plane, come here mm. and kill you. Mm. So if you don't want the terrorist in your land, you have to support us for your own sake, mm. even if you don't think about us. You know, the, the Iranian uh, diaspora, uh, which consists of more than 3 million Iranians living outside. Uh, 8 million. Uh, 8 million, okay. Yeah, yeah, we're much three, more. Three, okay, no, yeah. No. But whatever. Big power. Yeah. You are eight. But people like you uh, saying the thing you are saying, then the, then, the, then the shit regime consider you, you know, exile and enemy of the Iranian people. Uh, and you have lost your Iranian-ness, according, according to the regime. How, but how is the relation between you, know, you ex Iranian exile, and, and Iranian living inside Iran? Are you, are you thinking in I the mean, same ways? Well, first of all, I mean, regime saying that I have, uh, I have lost my Iranian-ness, you know, fuck them, because the only people that are not Iranian is them, you know? They don't, they don't dress like Iranian. Mm. They don't want to speak Farsi. Everything that they love is, has nothing to do with Iran. It's like this big sheet, whatever Muslim thing. And if for that they have to sacrifice Iran, they will do it. The biggest military force in Iran, they are called the guardian of the Islamic revolution. They are not called the guardian of Iran. So there is nobody less Iranian than Iranian government. So they are not going to give me a lesson about how Iranian I am. I'm extremely Iranian. I'm also very French. But I hate this thing that of the Iranian inside of Iran and the Iranian outside of Iran. This identity is so powerful. It's so much rooted in you that even in 1,000 years, if I could have 10 lives, at the end, you know, I will still, you know, 
behave like one. This is in me. I love the Iranian poetry. I love the Iranian gener generosity. I even love when Iranian people, you know, they lie to me and they tell me, oh, I love you and I love you so much. <laughs> and behind my back, just two seconds after, they say, oh, <laughs> I even love that because, you know, if I see someone for 30, 30 seconds, I want him or her to tell me, oh, you're beautiful, you know, you, you know your, your, your feet on my eyes, I die for you. And behind my back, they can say whatever, whatever they want. Even that I love in Iran. So, yes, I mean, yeah, I'm super Iranian. Sure. <laughs> and I think we can... We have yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, you will do that. No, but I just wanted to say, I mean, if this regime think that they can break us, I mean, they have to understand that 500 years of Arab invasion did not break us, that the Mughal, they did not break us, that the Turks, they did not break us, that nobody will break us, and that is not a few beardy old guy, you know, with, with you know, like they, they, this filthy-minded, sexual-obsessed people. These are not the people that are we break us. If they break us one time, we will break them ten times. So, Marian Sadr. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne Sartropi, for also making us laugh this morning. Um, we will now meet a remarkable uh, woman. Uh, Shirin Abadi is an author, lawyer, and was the first female judge in uh, Iran, living in exile in London since uh, 2001. As, and as mentioned, um, in 2003, she received the Nobel Peace Prize. Dr. Abadi, please join me on the stage. First of all, Shirin Abadi, um, upon learning that, that your former colleague and friend, uh, Nargis Mamedi, received the same prize as you 20 years later, uh, what was uh, your immediate reaction? It is natural, I became very glad. And the next feeling was that once more, we just uh, banged on the mouth of this regime and we were victorious. Because the Republic of Islamic of Iran in 2009 uh, attacked our NGO and uh, closed, shut down our office, which I had bought uh, by the using Nobel Prize money and sentenced, uh, detained my colleagues. However, up to this moment, we are working in Iran, however, underground, in an underground manner, secretive, because, you know, if they become aware of the identity of my colleague, they are in danger, they become in danger of detention. We are uh, oper uh, operating uh, uh, secretively. I'm very glad that awarding this uh, uh, prize to Nagas Mohammadi, it shows that whatever the regime does, it doesn't matter. What uh, is important that we are going ahead, we are proceeding with our plans. Just to speak a little bit more about uh, your, your uh, also story, my head is moving fully up there. Um, at the onset of the Islamic Revolution in, in, in February uh, 79, uh, uh, Abadi, uh, you initially held a belief in it. Uh, however, your perspective underwent a notable change uh, within a month. Um, what 
prompted this shift for you? Also, and what was the turning point that, that led to such a uh, rapid change in your uh, viewpoint? Man, as I, since the beginning, I was in agreement with the Islamic Republic of Iran because the slogans were independent and freedom. And anybody, a normal person, wants these. However, very immediately after that, very soon, we noticed that Khomeini was a lawyer. The very first lie was about in 8th of March to 1979, when less than two months after the victory of the revolution, he changed his world. Prior coming to Iran, he always claimed that Iranian women will be free, they are free to leave whatever, wherever they want. However, in 1979, it was 8 a.m. in the national radio, it was announced that the women were employees of the uh, governmental offices, uh, they have to wear a job. And at that point, I uh, understood that this man was a filthy lawyer and 8th of March, I left. We will uh, very soon continue to, to talk about uh, the future of Iran, uh, to discuss um, possible options, uh, but first uh, I will uh, invite our next guest up to the stage, that's Nassanin Bouniadi. Uh, she is the 20, 2023 Sydney Peace Prize Laureate and Amnesty International UQ Ambassador and a member of the Steering Committee for the World Movement of Democracy. She's also an acclaimed actress. Welcome! <laughs> Nassanin, um, first of all, you know, I, I, I know you are in contact with also a lot of Iranian women uh, inside Iran. And what kind of, what kind of stories do you hear from, from, from these uh, brave uh, women these days? You know, I think, first of all, thank you for having me. It's so wonderful to be with you. Um, people may think this revolution is, is dead. And I'm in constant contact with people on the ground inside Iran, particularly, the, particularly dissident women. And what, they, what people may not realize, the international community may not realize, is that if you're not seeing the same numbers on the streets, it's because this regime has brutalized the Iranian people. They can't go back on the streets. But the revolutionary fire is very much ablaze in the hearts and minds of Iran's embattled protesters. And women, Iran's brave women, are continuing to flout the compulsory hijab on, in the hundreds of thousands on the streets of major Iranian cities as we speak. Mm. As a long activist, you, yourself several times award-winning for, 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 for human rights, um, what do you think this Nobel Prize, Peace Prize to Nargis Mohammadi um, could change for your, for your country? I think Mrs. Abadi is right in the sense that this is a big blow to the, the regime. They count on the fact that we forget the Iranian movement for, for democracy. But something like this centers woman life freedom and centers the plight of the Iranian people for freedom, for democracy, for a secular democracy. Mm. And uh, it's extremely important. I think these moments are very important to shine a light on Iran's protesters. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, Ms. Mohammadi said it best in her speech, in her acceptance speech um, that, was, that was said by her children yesterday, that this is really for all of the Iranian people. Mm. I would like to invite our third uh, guest in this roundtable up uh, here to join me at the stage, uh, Mardad Darvis Pur. Welcome. Uh, you are an Iranian uh, Swedish 
socialist and uh, you're also a well-known figure of the Iranian Republican movement uh, and as a young student in uh, in Iran, Iran you were also arrested many many years ago um, I just want to start with you because uh, I found out that an Iranian pr proverb says a man and a mountain Marduku uh, used to describe how hard it is to change or influence someone who is stubborn and unyielding, uh, like a mountain. Um, is there any hope pressuring the, uh, uh, hope, uh, press, uh, pressuring the, the, the current political leadership to reform, or is it uh, Marduku? Thank you for your having me here. I prefer uh, talking in Persian. Uh, and I congratulate not only to Nargis Mohammadi, her family, to all Iranian nations and all of the freedom lovers people in Iran and in the world for this choice. And it was one of the most serious uh, uh, choices. Uh, that uh, could be chosen by the Nobel Committee. This, uh, awarding this uh, prize shows that the Nobel Committee has heard voice of Iranians and understood that this uh, reward is not only for one person. This is a collective prize who is standing against the, uh, uh, the suppression uh, until they can uh, get rid of the whole system, this regime in Iraq. The point I would like to raise is it is very important for me the importance of this prize. It shows that there is a third way for the change in Iran. And it is not necessary that we uh, just have a hope for the reform inside the country because it never happens. We do not need to have hope for the military action of the foreign uh, powers. We need to uh, support the Iranian own movement will uh, achieve such a aim in Middle East area, Middle East area, including Iran, the fight for democracy and freedom has a hundred years of background. However, much, many of these struggles have not resulted in anything, and it's resulted in the internal war and reproducing of uh, the repression. However, in Iran, also in the past revolution of the revolution, did not uh, uh, materialize the freedom and democracy. There is always a danger that the fight for change in Iran, if does not rely on the culture and the uh, principles, then it will reproduce another form of repression. However, in my view, 44 years of the rule by Islamic government has created another culture among Iranian people, and they do not believe in any sort of force which is based on the family, monarchy, etc. They only directed towards democracy, and I think sooner or later our society will reach to such a stage. And the Islamic Republic of Iran is just a bracket, a parasite in the uh, history of Iranian people. Madam Ebadi, is, is, um, is uh, reform, is, is that an option, or is it, you know, change of regime, completely change of regime, is that the solution? Chairperson <laughs> هر راهی که رفتیم هر کاری که کردیم متاسفانه به منبس برخورد حالا 
انقلاب به مردم ایران تحمیل شده نمیخواستیم Sorry, we were met with deadlock. We tried every which way possible, but we didn't get anywhere. Reforms did not work. We did not want violence. We wanted to act peacefully. We did everything. But I know we will, we will succeed. We want to remain peaceful in our protests. However, if any violence takes place, during our protests, it is not due to the protesters, it's because of the regime and the brutality of the regime. Now, let me add that the international community, what can the international community do to help us, to support us, to, to get rid of this regime without any bloodshed? Look, I'm a jurist. I'm a lawyer. Let me speak to you a bit about the law. Well, we, you could use international law to help us. One way which could really aid the Iranian people in order to topple this brutal regime is to find ways through which we can take the regime to international tribunals. That would pave the way towards toppling the regime, using the international law. In Iran, many anti-women laws, discriminatory anti-women laws were adopted after the revolution, and I'm going to give you a few examples. For instance, the value of a woman's life is considered to be that of half of a man. For instance, if my brother and I happen to be in some accident on the street, the court in Iran awards my brother twice as much in damages than me. The testimony of two women is tantamount to the testimony of man, one man. A man in Iran can have up to four wives and he can divorce them at any time he chooses to, whereas it's almost impossible for a woman to obtain divorce. As regards inheritance, a woman inheritance half of that of a um, that of a man. And there are dozens of other discriminatory laws against the women. And I've just given you very few examples. This discriminatory situation against women, how, how is it different to, let's say, South Africa, where uh, black people were deprived of their rights? How different is it from North uh, America, from the United States of America, before blacks in, uh, or colored people realize their rights. My, uh, my question is this. Why is it that international law only sees apartheid in relation to race, whereas people of color are not necessarily, they don't necessarily constitute half of the population. However, women do constitute half of the population of any country around the world. If, if, uh, you accept, if you officially recognize the apartheid in South Africa, why not recognize a gender apartheid by international law? Which, uh, and if we do, you will see that in Iran, Afghanistan, you can use by... Um, international law in order to improve the plight of uh, women in these countries. All Islamic women want this. We have a gender fight, and we need international law for that. And um, as I said, the women constitute half the world's population, so we have to think about legal routes, legal channels. It's not about just about killing each other or chanting slogans or sanctions. Use the law. International countries, especially Norway, they can oppose that, uh, for, uh, that uh, there should be such laws, that they should officially recognize uh, a gender apartheid, and once they do, believe me, then the Iranian regime could be 
uh, tried for crimes against humanity. And it will be very easily done. We will be able to topple the regime very easily through use of international law. So that is how you can help us. We're not saying attack Iran, but please help us take this brutal regime to international tribunals to make them um, answerable for their crimes. How would you like to comment this? Because also, you know, what way can you know external pressure towards the regime, you know, what can it change? This is extremely important what Mrs. Abadi says, and we have a unique and time-bound opportunity at the moment to have gender apartheid recognized and defined under international law mm. because there is a treaty, the Crimes Against hum uh, Humanity Treaty, that is currently being negotiated globally. And we need UN member states, we need the international community to stand exactly, do exactly what Mrs. Ebadi says and recognize, call for the recognition of gender apartheid under international law. Why? Because the oppression and segregation of women is a pillar of this regime. If that pillar crumbles, the regime will crumble. When we say this is a women-led revolution, when we say it's a feminist revolution, this is what we mean. Iranian women have managed to galvanize Iranian society at large to understand the intersectionality of women's rights and every other human right ethnic minority rights, religious minority rights, LGBTQ rights, political right to dissent, freedom of expression. Every single one of these rights is inextricably bound to women's rights. Because as Marjan said, women's rights are human rights. And I want to go back to 79 for a second. When the, the compulsory hijab was imposed, there were women who came out in protest, who risked their violence and, and lashes and imprisonment and harassment, and they came out to protest because they understood early on, as Mrs. Ebadi did, that when you do that to women, every, everything else in, in the society will go downhill. There were women who, because they themselves wore the veil, they thought, well, what's the big deal? So what, it's a law. <laughs> And they just went along with their lives and they didn't protest. And then we have a third segment of society. Women who were willing to sacrifice women's rights at the altar of anti-imperialism. And I ask you, and I'm calling on the Iranian people because they know this all too well, that they will never sacrifice women's rights at any altar, no matter what that altar is never sacrifice human rights, dignity, women's rights at any altar, no matter what gain you think you're attaining. Because if women's rights don't exist, human rights cannot exist. And that's what Iran is faced with right now. Can I I just want to uh, go back to you, uh, Mr. Darvispur. Um, you also used the word, uh, not revolution, but revolution. Mm. Mm -hmm. Can I just first yeah? say something about uh, Shirin Abadi? Uh, this is an important issue, I think. Gender segregation and gender, gender apartheid is not the same, and this is very important. The Iran government is gender apartheid. You have to insist to this issue. This is very important. Because when you use gender apartheid, you mean systematically the government use everybody, everything, ideology, political, and every structure uh, uh, issue for systematically excluded women from society. Because I think this is very important, as you say. It's not a question about gender segregation. It's a question about gender apartheid. Mm. But come back to your question. Yeah, okay. I just want to come back to you know, that, that okay. you, you know, revolution is yes, not what that. you see okay. in the yes. future, but you are more like, uh, you know, a re yes. 
a mix of reforms yes. and revolution. How I continue to Persian because yeah. this is an important issue. When you speak about revolution, what a concept of revolution or, a, or a, a reforms, a revolutionary reforms or structural developments, instead of saying revolution or reforms, we have to highlight two issues here. First, we want to stress we do not want a violent revolution. We do not want violence, because violence never in the world has led to democracy. But at the same time, we want to emphasize that this is not the kind of regime that is going to be reformed. It's not a Western democracy that can be reformed. It's not possible in this Islamic system. So we have to, how we are going to topple this system. Nevertheless, to topple it, we need to do this peacefully. But we need to do this peacefully without pe people paying such a huge price with their lives. We have to bear in mind, violence breeds violence. We have to eschew violence as much as possible. But, as Mr. Zabadi said, there are two kinds of violence. There is defensive violence, there is aggressive violence. Aggressive violence uh, ends in ruining a country. Aggressive violence uh, wants to bring about destruction, whereas uh, if it's defensive violence, it's about survival, because we want to survive. So when people find that they have no choice but to use violence, that is defensive violence. Nevertheless, we have done our utmost to maintain this peaceful nature of our revolution, to send a message to the international community, to the regime, to the people of Iran, that we want the transition from this government to be done without paying a heavy price, because that would be not only in the interest of the Iranian people, but in the interest of the region and interest of the world, if we do so peacefully. We are living in a world where the violence is the first speaker. And the conservatives, Al Qaeda, Republic Islamic of Iran, fundamentalists, because of their presence. And not only that, but also other countries, they are dealing with the, the suppressive regimes. And this fight for transmission to democracy is not easy. This fight uh, would be very optimistic if we think that one day, uh, in, in the matter of one day, this will result in democracy. Because as Majon said, without the culture of democracy, the materialization of democracy is very hard. We have to organize dialogue among the sections in the society and the democratic culture should become uh, uh, very uh, a principle. And this uh, uh, woman life and freedom showed that uh, the, what, what message do they have? Uh, this movement shows that uh, by uh, repeating woman life freedom, it showed that they are looking for a reason. Uh, they are looking for being reasonable, and they show to the international community that the feminist movement in the West should uh, honor and should respect the Iranian women who organized the first feminist uh, revolution in the world and showed the path towards the democracy, to the world. Ms. Uh, Bounadi, uh, we have to talk about you know, the, the opposition. Uh, it's also a key for the future of Iran. And, and the opposition abroad is, as, as we know, very fractious, and it seems like uh, it has been uh, like this for the last 40 years. Uh, uh, 
What do you think the, the current situation uh, is of the for, for opposition abroad, and 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 what could you do to 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 be able to work together? So, Sahtar Zodan, the man. Um, it was the most difficult question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So, <laughs> I, I, I want to backtrack a little bit. That's a very excellent question, and it's a very important question, so thank you for asking it. Um, as a human rights activist for 15 years, for two decades now, members of the human rights community have often told me not to conflate human rights activism with democracy activism. In fact, when I joined our, our little group of, uh, in a, an attempt to, to pave a way forward for democracy for Iran, I did get some backlash from the human rights community. Why, as a human rights activist, are you engaged in a democracy movement? Here's why I fundamentally disagree that these two things should not be conflated. If the pillars of a system ensure its wrongs cannot be made right, the pillars of the system need to change. That's what the Iranian people have risen up to do once every decade since 1979. And that's why we formed a group early on in Woman Life Freedom mm. as a way to bring the different factions that we have, and we have many factions, <laughs> ideological factions, um, as, as, a, as a hope for the Iranian people. And by the way, we did this because I'm very proud to have sat alongside Ms. Abadi uh, on that path, because it was something that hadn't really been done, attempted before. Mm. How can we bring these different factions together, ideological factions, with one goal in mind, secular democracy? Mm. Because as we know, the reform movement is dead. Reform is impossible because, as I said, the pillars ensure that the system is irreformable. And now we have the vast majority of the Iranian people coming together saying they want this regime gone. They want a secular democracy. Mm. The only way to achieve that is for disparate voices to unite. I still, I know that we join each other in this uh, and we, we agree on this, that the only way forward is unity. Um. But, but this unity, this unity is, yes. is not there when we were planning these conferences. I talked to a lot of people yes. who say, I cannot be on the same stage and, as this and this person. So I think that you, it's really a, you really have a job to do to, to be able to you know, speak yeah, with all no, I, yeah. like, like I didn't say it was easy and de democracy yeah. doesn't happen overnight. But what we have to do is live and breathe democracy. We cannot preach democracy. We have to be the change we want to see. And I, and I, I don't mean this to be some abstract idea. I mean in your families, in your immediate environment. We have to civilly be able to disagree. We have to be able to agree on the fundamentals of what we want for a secular democratic Iran. And we have to understand that that future includes people who want a constitutional monarchy, mm. includes Republicans, and everything in between. We have to agree to disagree, but agree on one thing only, and that is a peaceful transition to a secular democracy. If we can base just that alone. Mm. And he said, the, uh, a fractious opposition, it's a big gift to the, to the regime, uh, I guess. Um, what is your solution on, you know, for the Nobel Peace Prize, you are former Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Dialogue is one of the kind of key words also for, 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 for the Nobel Peace Prize. So, so what is your answer to, to, to succeed to, to gather people around the table and, and be able to find a kind of common platform. Look, the differences that uh, exist among the oppositions, those who oppose the regime, are 
in fact divided into two groups if we want to look at them. The first difference is between the monarchists and the republicans, and this difference has existed since the 1979 revolution, and it continues. Some people want monarchy and some people want republic. And the second difference is between the extremist nationalists and also the minority groups that want federations in Iran. Some people are saying, extremists are saying, look, for instance, if some parts of Iran become autonomous, that means that Iran is going to be disintegrated. Look, so these are two differences of opinions that exist. The bulk of our uh, difference is these groups. And for 44 years, we are still arguing all, uh, about this. And who is benefiting from our differences? Only the regime. So I am really happy that this revolution of women, life, freedom, has now uh, uniting our people more. Why? Because we have found our commonalities. We have come to realize that rather than being, uh, we have more uh, issues in common than differences. We all want this regime to be toppled because as we said, this regime cannot be reformed. We have proven that. We want a democratic and secular regime. For 44 years, we have suffered a theocracy in Iran. We have seen the result of that. We do not want the status quo to continue. We want a secular government. Also, a thick, uh, a secular government or even a theocracy can be within a monarchy. The secular government, we, or we could have a regime, uh, democracy like Norway, or we could have a republic like uh, Fr France. You have monarchy here, but uh, and uh, they have republic in France. So we could choose a, a Either way. But now we can vote about it. Now that we have come to some kind of unity and unanimity of view, we could go to the ballot box to decide. We have, it's time has come to stop our differences, whether we want a monarchy or whether we want a republic. Because what we all do have in common is that we want this regime to go. And once the regime is doubled, then we go to the ballot box. Then we can all choose what kind of a, a government we want. And I can say that fortunately, the Iranian people have learned lessons both from the former monarchy of the Shah, which, yes, people were comfortable, but it was not a democracy. Yes, Iranian people lived in um, comfort, but we didn't have political freedom. We had individual freedom. We, uh, we could wear what we wanted under the Shah, but we lacked political freedom. So it's important that I highlight that. Uh, I, I don't re ever remember free elections under the Shah because I stress we had no political freedom, and that is why people rev uh, staged a revolution in 1979. So we have that experience. And for 44 years, and now we have had this brutal experience of a theocracy of the Islamic Republic that's very despotic. Now, what we are saying that a monarchy can uh, be this despotic republic. Look at uh, Saddam Hussein. Look at Bashar al-Assad. Uh, so uh, even a president can be a dictator. So it doesn't matter whether it's a monarchy or a republican regime. So what we want is that not only a country should be secular and uh, democratic, but the power should be in the hands of parliament, that even if we have a presidential republic, the president should be symbolic, but it should not be a president for life, such as Ali of in Azerbaijan or Bashar Assad in Syria or the late Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Yes, they were president, but they were despot, despots. So 
we need a parliament. We need a strong parliament. That's the kind of the regime we want. And uh, it, even if we have a monarchy again, it should be a symbolic uh, monarchy, not a monarchy that has a uh, full authority and full power. And I think our people have come to realize that. So I am an optimist. I really know that we will uh, uh, reach democracy, but through the ballot box, once the regime is toppled. Miss, uh, Miss Bernadier, wh what is your strategy now to, to, you know, once again try to get people to the table to discuss some of these issues that uh, Miss Abadi just raised? You know, I think there's, in the world, I think there's a lot of shouting going on, people mm. enforcing their ideas on other people. There's not enough listening. We're not listening to each other. The only way dialogue happens between well-intended people who want democracy is to sit around a table and have civil conversation. The very thing we want to happen in Iran, we have to be able to accomplish here first, right? Dissidents in Iran are telling me they can't organize because as soon as they dissent, they're, they're lashed, they're imprisoned, they're blinded, they're raped. We've heard the testimonies today. So they need us not to lead them, but to be the, the echoes of their voices, to carry their voices, and to organize for them from outside as much as they can, they, they, they will instruct us. They will tell us what they want, they will tell us what they need, and it's our job to do that. I was recently in Sydney, and I read the testimony, of, or I read a message from someone inside Iran, a prominent actress who wanted me to share this with dissidents outside Iran, the diaspora expats. Because for far too long, the Iranian, the Islamic Republic has tried to discredit the diaspora as out of touch shills for the West, Western stooges. We don't know what we're talking about. I was 20 days when I left Iran. What am I doing on this stage? I'll tell you what I'm doing on this stage. My parents were political dissidents against this regime and were forced into exile. I, my mother was 19 and heavily pregnant with me when she stood up bravely in 1979 against the formation of the Islamic Republic among the minority of Iranians who dared to stand against the formation of this regime. Thank you. But what this actress said to me, who I cannot name because her life would be endangered in Iran if I do, she said that we were forced to be here, most of us. This is not our choice. But like millions of messages in bottles, we have landed at shores across the world, and we are echoing the voices, their voices inside Iran. We are a continuation of their voices. We are an extension of each other. Never let anyone tell you that we are not Iranian. Just some, uh, Mr. Uh, Daris, just, just, just some words here at, uh, at the end also about the geopolitical situation. Uh, we have the war in Gaza. Uh, we know where Iran is standing, who they are supporting. Um, how, how has the last month kind of changed the situation? Do, do, do you have to think also in a different way when it comes to, to the path forward for, for Iran? Just first, a uh, short comment about um, Shirin about this uh, uh, issue. I think this is very important. We talk about uh, unity is very important. I continue to Persian. I mix uh, language. Uh, I think that uh, it's very important that uh, the unity that uh, Mrs. Abadi stressed upon. But there are two kinds of uh, 
unity is the kind of unity that they had under the Shah. All those who opposed the Pahlavi regime, just because they opposed Pahlavi regime, um, they united just because they wanted to get rid of the Shah. And uh, that leads, led to even more tragedy. Uh, so, one of the lessons we learned from the 1970s, without thinking of negative, uh, thinking negatively, we have to try and think positively. Look, yes, we all agree that this regime has to go, but do we all have the same opinion about the makeup of democracy? I'm not sure. I think that the Islamic regime, if we want to define it in what word, is a, a theocracy, is a despot, is an authoritarian a theocracy, and which is based on discrimination, discrimination against women, discrimination against LGBTQ, uh, against uh, minorities, there is a variety of discrimination. So, the opposition has to be very careful that, uh, when it comes to democracy. So, they don't want to go from uh, going from the Shah to Mullahs and then from Mullahs to yet another dictatorship. That is what we don't want. So this you are agreeing about, but just to be, uh, at the end here, not just some words about how do you think about the geo geopolitical situation? Yes. Uh, 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 what is changing now? What has changed? In my view, the war in Gaza is the most op best opportunity for the Republic Islamic of Iran in order to focus uh, to be removed from Iran and the Women Life Freedom Movement. And that focus goes and concentrate on another conflict which has the roots as uh, old as decades ago. And the Islamic regime of Iran is a claimant for the Palestinian rights. And then we are facing conflict over there without me uh, to analyze the roots of that conflict. I would say the peace uh, in Gaza and ceasefire in Gaza not only is in benefit of the um, people in the area, but also it is in the benefit of the Iranian people, international community, and it allows the Iranian people to focus, to concentrate on the fight against the Islamic regime, who is the most uh, uh, important barrier of democracy. We have to end this uh, round table. Just to you, uh, Miss Munadi uh, at, uh, at the end here, as a, as a child of the revolution, no doubt you have decided to revis uh, revisit uh, Iran, uh, should it turn to a secular uh, democracy, as we agree about that this is, will be the future, according to you, uh, for, for your, for your uh, home country. And, but what is your hope and dream and, 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 and what would you do if you, you went back there? You know, I think rapporteur Tumaj Salehi, who is now back in prison, said it best when he was asked. He said that a free and democratic Iran is one in which pe the people walk onto the streets and they don't worry about being abducted and taken to an undisclosed uh, destination and uh, being harassed and targeted by the security forces. Uh, for me, a, a free and democratic Iran is one in which people have their full inalienable rights, where women are equal to men before the law, and, um, and, and that there's civility in politics. Um, and I hope for that day, I hope my parents can return, I hope I can return, I hope we can all return and celebrate Iran's freedom. Because I know for a fact that as was echoed by my friends on this stage, that a free and democratic Iran is not only to the benefit of the Iranian people, it will bring peace to the region and global stability. It is in all of our interests, every free, freedom-loving, democratic country in this world to back the people of Iran.
Thank you very much, uh, dear panel, for these uh, wise thoughts. I hope we learned something new here out in the audience. So a uh, big warm applause for the Thank panel. Thank you. Our last speaker uh, will give us closing remarks. Um, he is the president of the Norwegian uh, parliament, uh, and his name is Masud uh, Garakani. He was born in uh, Tehran in 82, and he emigrated to Norway with his family in, uh, in uh, 1987. And he's been a clear and uh, vocal uh, in his support for the demonstration and the fight for democracy, freedom, and, uh, and, and human dignity in Iran. It's a pleasure to give the floor to the president of the Norwegian parliament. Welcome. First of all, I'm humbled to share this stage with so many freedom fighters and it made deep impression on me listening to all the stories Amnesty shared about people inside Iran. It makes me cry, it makes me angry, but most of all it motivates me to keep on fighting for the future of Iran. You know, this beautiful country, the Kingdom of Norway, which is my country today, has enormous resources, like oil and gas, just like Iran. Each year, this country and the capital of Oslo becomes an international stage for humanity and freedom fighters. I always say, what makes my country, Norway, a successful and rich country are those values, not the oil and gas. Because the most important resources you have in a country is the human capital. Thank you so much to the Nobel Institute and University of Oslo for arranging this important discussion in the wake of annual Peace Prize ceremony. This year's laureate is an exceptionally worthy winner and the focus of today's forum, Iran burning for democracy, is highly relevant. Because the forces who burn for a free and democratic Iran are many. They can be found inside the country itself, but also outside its borders. And it's important that those of us on the outside engage. It's sad, but true that the fight for Iran's future cannot be won by those who are taken to the streets alone. We hope it brings a sense of security to those who are left that they know we are watching, they know we are following, and they know we are trying to hold this brutal regime to account for its crimes it commits against its own people. Dear friends, I'd like to paint a picture for you. When I sit in the Storting Chamber in my parliament, I can hear the sounds of the demonstrations outside, whether it's people protesting against the war in Ukraine, people who believe that we politicians are not doing enough to stop what's taking place in Gaza, or those who think the electricity prices are too high. The views may be many, but there is one thing that unites the demonstrators. They're using their democratic right, their freedom of speech, to express themselves about issues they are passionate about. And this is not just something they're allowed to do. We politicians meet them and listen to what they have to say. We have all heard it during today's discussion. The brave people who are demonstrating in Iran, the country of my birth, are risking so much to gain a small portion of what we here take for granted. Those who dare to stand up to the regime face the morality of police. They face passage, they face torture and execution, they face batons and bullets. Like my friend Elahetava Koleyan, who is here today. She was forced to flee from everything, 
including the most precious she has, her children. The Iranian regime took an eye, but never her hope, the hope for a free and democratic Iran, because this is what the demonstrations are all about. The hijab is a powerful symbol of what the people are trying to achieve, namely the freedom to be able to shape one's life and respect for fundamental human rights. Masa Gina Amini's tragic and pointless death was the last straw. I do not believe for one minute that the brutal regime in Iran will change. How can you change a regime which is built on and practices evil? When you rape children, kids, kids, that's evil, that's evil. Dear friends, yet there is something which makes me believe in Iran. It's the fearless young people, women and men. My hope for Iran's many young people is that one day they will experience the same I've grown up with here in Norway. Democracy, freedom and justice. This year's Peace Prize goes to a courageous lioness, Nargis Mohammadi. This year's Peace Prize goes to all of you who belong to the Women Life Freedom Movement. It's the right prize and it's an important prize. No Iranian will be free until Iran, Iran's women are free, nor will there be a peace until this goal has been achieved. Our role as watchers from the outside is to show our support for the demands Nargis Mohammadi and all the rest of you are making. You must show without doubt that we see you and you must dare to be your voice when you yourselves are silenced, which is why we must also support the forces who are working for a democratic alternative in Iran. The Iranian people must take out their own path, but we should recognize those who are trying to gather a united opposition built on fundamental values, respect for human rights, freedom of speech, equality, sovereignty of the people, and free and fair elections. That's what the country of Norway is about. That should be what Iran should be about. And the opposition, and the opposition has a duty to show a united force against the evil and injustice that the Iranian people are living under. Hambastigi, 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 if you want an envelope in Iran. And the Peace Prize should also be a reminder to all the leaders who talk about democracy. Listen to the Iranian people, not to the brutal regime. Stand on the right side of the history. This is not only about Iran's future, it's also about the future of democracy in the world. That the powers in Tehran can do as they please, without consequences, threatens the security and liberty of far more people than just the Iranians. We can see this in Ukraine, and we can see this in the Middle East. The regime's fight for survival prompts it to embroil itself on conflicts outside its own borders. To those following today who disagree with what's being said, and I know you are watching, here's a reminder. A country's most important resource is its people. Those who murder their own people have no decency, no humanity, and no future and you have lost your most important guarantee for our future prosperity. What good are natural resources where there are no longer people in the country to make use of them? I would like to thank all of you for taking part in this debate and discussion today. You are paying a high price for openly criticizing the brutal and evil regime in Iran. But you do so because you love your country. We can hear you. I will build you up, my country, sings the famous Daryush. I'm certain about one thing. There will come a time when no mother has to cry for a child who has lost an eye, lost a life. Dear everyone, Zan Zendegi Azadi and Marjan Jan.
And my John John, you know, it's not protocol for me to use the F word, <laughs> but we need more love. And the Iranian people, they stand for love. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Masoud Garankani. We will uh, end this uh, conference in uh, some second. The goal of this year's Nobel Peace Prize Forum was to give you an opportunity to, to learn more about the situation um, Iranians are facing in their daily life and how we can better understand the problem both the Iranian in Iran and in the region. So thank you everyone for joining us today on behalf of the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, uh, uh, no, the, the, Nobel, the, the Nobel Institute. Have a wonderful day and uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs>